Uh, grew up in the Bronx, born in the Bronx. Uh, had two brothers and a sister. Uh, really, really close family. When my mom and dad got married, they got married in Toronto, Canada. Wound up coming to New York City because they thought the, and heard the streets were paved with gold. When they came to New York, my father's first job was a trolley car conductor. And he ran around the Bronx in his trolley car. And in the wintertime, it was too cold for him. So uh, the trolleys were run by the uh, IRT, Independent Rabbit Transit. So he switched from the trolleys to the subway. And he spent his entire career working in the booth, giving out change in directions. And people come in, and when the subway used to be a nickel, you know, they'd come in with a dollar and they'd give them the change. And we used to collect uh, papers and aluminum foil and tin cans. And we had a little radio wagon, red wagon, and we'd walk around the neighborhood singing, Hitler is a jerk, Mussolini is a meanie. But the Japs are worse. <laughs> yeah, I had a really, really good childhood. Did you grow up with certain aspirations or expectations about what you would do with your life? Had none. You had none. I was not a very, very good high school student. I went to a good, tough Catholic high school, uh, taught by brothers and uh, uh, very few lay people and some priests, quite a few priests. What school was that? Cardinal Hayes. It was in the Bronx on the Grand Concourse. She used to take the subway down every day to school. When I went to high school, there were 2,500 kids between the main building and two satellite locations. I went to, I lived in a place called Parkchester. There was a Holy Family church and school Hayes had a whole floor in the school, and I went over there for my first year and then took the subway down for my sophomore, junior, and senior year. But, you know, I wasn't that good a student. I, I did all right. I didn't flunk anything, but I had no college ambitions until after I got out. My first job, when I graduated from high school, I was 17. Needed a job, got on my bike, Rode off over to Christidi Brothers grocery chain warehouse. All right? Parked the bike, went in and filled out an application. And on the application, it lists all the things that they had available uh, being a grocery clerk, produce clerk, warehouse person, unload trucks. And one of them was apprentice butcher. And I said, wow, there it is. Never, I, thought never entered my mind. Checked apprentice butcher. The guy that took the application looked at it and says, well, we can't do anything until you're 18. You have to come back when you're 18, which is at the end of July. So he said, I'll pass this over to Leonard Scholl was his name. Wait here and I'll have Leonard talk to you and then you can leave. Went in to see Leonard. I've always been a gregarious guy. Leonard and I, I'll never forget the guy, really personable. He said, you know, there's too many restrictions employment-wise for people. On, you know, you need working papers and everything else. You know, come back the Monday after you're 18 and we'll put you to work. I said, fine. And this, Christi and this uh, Parkchester, there were three big Christidi stores. He said, do you have a car? I said, no. He said, all right, we'll give you the store closest to the bus. So I took the bus to work every morning and took the bus home. Then there were non-union, worked six days a week, eight hours a day. Uh, the union came in and made a big push, and they, the company really tried to keep them out, but everybody voted union in. And after that, first thing they did went down to five days a week. And they used to be closed on Sundays, but I'm sure that's not the case now. So I spent three years as a butcher apprentice and worked my way up. I figured it was a trade I could always have the rest of my life. But after working and then winding up going in the service, I figured now I've got to do something better than this. So 
Uh, my brother was in the Coast Guard, stationed in St. George, Staten Island, and Pier 9 East River. He said, hey, Frank, the only way to go is for you to join the Coast Guard Reserve or the Coast Guard. Well, I figured, well, let me try the Reserve. I went active in the Reserve on February 20th, uh, 1951, and got out five years later on February 19th, 1955. You know, I don't like, well, for one of the things, after I got out of high school, uh, there were a lot of Cardinal Hayes guys in the police department and the fire department. And my brother said to me, hey, you know, you can go to work for the police department or the fire department in a wink. You know, just go down, to tell them you're a Hayes graduate. No, you'll have a job. And I didn't want to shoot people or fight people or do anything. You know, I didn't want to get balanced in anything like that. But again, still, I didn't know what I wanted to do. While I was in the service, uh, well, before I went in, the draft board called me up and sent me a card. And I was classified 1AP. And I didn't know what the P was. And the draft board was over on Arthur Avenue in the Bronx. I went over with my card and I said, what does this P mean? He says, it's postponement. I said, what does a postponement mean? You get a year before you get active in the social, civil, or the social security, not social security, civil service. Uh, I said, take the P away. Let me go active right away. He said, okay, we'll take the P away, but you have to go in the army right away. I said, I'll keep the P. <laughs> so the day before I was supposed to report, you know, to be inducted, I went active in the Coast Guard. Uh, boot camp for Coast Guard was 13 weeks at the time. Uh, for the reservists, they had us do two week boot camp. Uh, we worked harder for two weeks than the guys that were in the camp ordinarily. We got up at six, we were out on the Atlantic Ocean rowing uh, every day, every day. One of these big whaling boats and for all day long, we we're busy, busy, always something. Classes, rifle range, we didn't go to bed at 10 o'clock at night. The other guys quit at five. You know, and they wanted to cram so much in those two weeks, so. And you kind of learn how to salute, how to march, that oh, kind of stuff? All that stuff, yep. Did you like it? Manual. Oh, I love this service. I really did. Did you like boot camp, though? Yeah. You did? I Why? did. It was fun. Yeah, you're in with a bunch of young guys who all have the same problems, all the same outfit, you know, all the, basically the same complaints, but a, a great, great experience. In fact, I say if I had been an officer in the Coast Guard, I, pro I may have stayed in, but I was on a ship in St. George, Staten Island. One of the fellows on the ship was from Malone, New York, which is north, northern part of New York State. And I was writing for school catalogs. And he said to me, why don't you write to Clarkson for a catalog? I said, Clarkson, what's it? Never heard of it before. Where is it? He says, it's up in Potsdam, New York. Okay, what's their address? Just Clarkson College, Potsdam, New York. No, nothing else. Sent a letter out, said, hey, I'm in the service, send me a, a catalog. Picked the catalog, looked through the catalog, and Clarkson was the first school in the country to offer a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Distribution. It was set up by a couple of industrial distribution associations in the country who wanted people to sell technical products. If they took a guy who was a college graduate, he was a history major, or an English major, a literature major. You know, he was like this. He didn't have any technical. If he had took a straight engineer, he was like this. You know, he was straight and narrow and didn't have any of this. So let's try something else. Approach Clarkson. A BS ID was one third engineering and science, one third business, and one third liberal studies. And it was basically to teach guys and train guys to go out and sell industrial products. And that's all I ever wanted to do. Every year, I spent two weeks on the Mariposa, which is a buoy tender. And I spent two weeks on Ellis Island, you know, in a little 40-foot patrol boat. And we'd go around New York Harbor looking for whatever, and we never found anything. 
you know, it was a case of futility. So how did life change when you went uh, active duty? Uh, well, because I was a reservist, I believe, they wound up putting me on this Coast Guard cutter, uh, the Mackinac, at St. George, Staten Island. Used to take the subway home whenever I went home or go down Times Square or bum around or float around Staten Island. But I was, you know, always within probably 25, 30 miles of the house. No problem. I go home, sleep in my own bed and do whatever in my folks' house. But uh, there was a guy up in Boston who wanted to, uh, well, he got engaged. And the ship that he was on in Boston, the exact same kind as mine, the exact same rate. At the time, I was a, a seaman or a fireman. I started as a seaman, went down the engine room, went into fireman, wound up working, you know, with all that stuff down below. This guy sent a letter out to the ship that I was on, said, I just got engaged. Ship I'm on is going down the East Coast through the Panama Canal going up to San, San Diego, and we're gonna bunk permanently in Hawaii. Was anybody like to get off where they are and change places with me? Coast Guard had a thing called the mutual. And a mutual is you do this at your own expense. I went to the people in the ship I was on, I said, would you approve this? And they said, yeah. They went to the ship that he was on, they approved it, and they said, yeah. They sent the paperwork to the third district, which is New York City, the fifth district, which is Boston, and one of those turned it down because I had not been on the Mackinac for six months. You have to be on a duty station for six months before you can transfer off. They said reapply when your six months are up, but it was too late then, and they were already gone, so I never made an effort to pursue that any further. But I would have loved to have been in Hawaii for a year and a half. Yeah. A year and a half. While you're working the fireman, the engine man, everybody has the same thing. You're not really, it's just a rating and a rank. Uh, we had two big diesel engines, a generator and a boiler. You know, and down the engine, we took care of all that. Uh, I went down out on patrol. First time out on patrol was the day after I switched down the engine room. We used to go up to Argentia, Newfoundland for one day, for 24 hours exactly. It was a Navy base up there. No matter what time we got there, if it was in the morning, the afternoon, or night, and I don't know what the regulation, we had to stay exactly 24 hours, and then we went out to this duty station out in the middle of the North Atlantic. Down the engine room, the new smell of diesel, headed up to Argentia, Newfoundland, I got seasick. And this is the first time we went out. And I said, I'm going to I think I'm going to have a problem. And I'd be on watch with a bucket beside me. I ate every meal twice. I'd run up to the mess hall, eat. They said, you don't want to up chuck on an empty stomach. I went up and before the meal and the mess deck was secure, <laughs> I'd go back, <laughs> chow down again. And we had saltines. I ate saltines all the time. Went up to a Jensen Newford, sat on the dock at the dock for 24 hours. We didn't move, then went out, and that's the only time I was ever seasick. And that cured you? Yeah. After that, I don't know what the secret was, but after that, there were times the ocean, well, they have a couple of duty stations in the North Atlantic, and the three of them were on trans-oceanic air lanes. Uh, it was a 200 square mile grid. These three ships were stationed 200 miles apart. Each one carried two weathermen, National Service weathermen, sent up balloons four times a day with a radio transmitter on it. The radio transmitter would relay that information back. They sent that back to the States or wherever they sent. And we contacted every single plane that flew across the Atlantic. We had a great big radar system. Who are you, where are you going? And, you know, we felt comfortable. And I told a story about a guy, well, when I went to Clarkson, I was the only Coast Guard guy. I think 40% of the guys I went to school with were vets. And the only reason I got into Clarkson was because I was, I was a vet. 
and had service time and had worked, could never have gotten in on my grades. And they said, well, we'll give him a chance. Said, well, get him. But this Air Force guy would fly across the Atlantic in these big Air Force planes that rumble and creak and moan and groan. And they, every time they took off and over the Atlantic, I wonder if they'd ever make it. And halfway across the ocean, they'd look down and they'd see a little dot on the water. You know, there's a little red light on top of the ship. And, you know, that was a little bit of comfort to those guys going across. If they were anywhere close and they ditched, maybe they could, you know, be there to pick up. And when Eisenhower flew over the Atlantic for meetings in Europe, there was a ship every 200 miles, Coast Guard, Navy, Merchant Marine, whoever. But they wanted to make sure, God forbid, his plane should go down. There'd be someone fairly close to maybe assist in the rescue. We had 137 guys with 10 officers. Uh, great group of guys. Really? Really, really. Well, the only problem with guys in the service that are single, you know, they go ashore and they get tanked up and they come back and they got a snoot for <laughs> a little while, you know. You know, these guys, I'd be on, you know, although I was in the engine room, the ship ran three different complements. Uh, it went uh, three different sections. Whenever we were in port, two of the sections could go ashore and the other section stayed on board. And the engine room people had to man the gangplank at night when our section's turn was up. And these guys had come back, you know, from being in Times Square, oh, I went to the Silver Dollar, and I went to the moon. They'd be up in the next morning, and I'd be sitting at breakfast, still half hungover. I don't know what I did last night after 12 o'clock. I said, I know exactly what you did. Well, what did I do? Well, you went to the half moon, and you, <laughs> you went to the Silver Dollar. <laughs> How did you know that? You told me all about it when you crawled up the gangway. <laughs> On the deck, there were two lockers, locker for me and a locker for the guy who was in the bunk beneath me. The bunks were just wires with springs on it with a little two-inch mattress. You know, and I'd climb up on the, I was in the top one and the other guy was in the bottom one and that was the, the sleeping accommodations. Uh, all the guys in the engine room had the last compartment on the ship, and you could hear the screw when it left the water. Sometimes the sea was so rough, you had a head into the wave, and you were up on top of the wave, just floating there for a minute before it came down on the other side. The screw was out of the water and <laughs> without any friction. It picked up speed, it raced the engines, until it got back in the water. And that's dangerous, right? It this... could be, absolutely. They think that's what may have happened to Alfaro. She lost her propulsion. You know, it tilted, it was out of the water long enough, and they couldn't get it started again to rectify the situation. It broke up, up and sank in the bottom of the ocean. But on one, we used to have drills all the time, just about every day, some kind of drill. And on one of those trips, we were out. The ship hit so hard when it landed in the water, it activated the general quarters alarm. And this alarm went off like three in the morning. You know, and everybody, no matter what you're in your skivvies, and you go to your duty station, and they time you, all right? This was not a drill. This wasn't planned. It's just something that happened. <laughs> And after everybody was in their positions and everybody, you know, we had two engine rooms. Engine room number one reporting the bridge, engine room two reporting the bridge. You know, every station, you know, the, the Fantel, the, the mess deck and everything else. And they said, okay, guys, this is what happened. <laughs> that tripped because of the pounding and go back to bed or assume your, your station, whatever you were doing. So your station is, is it patrolling within your Quadrant? Yeah, 200 miles square. Okay. Uh, pleasant weather, calm sea. Sometimes the ocean out there was like glass. I mean, it was just amazing. You know, no waves or nothing, hardly. You know, just a couple of ripples. 
they used to go up to the far end, cut the engine, let it idle, and let the wind and the tide drift back down to the bottom of the 200-mile grid, turn around, start the engine up, and go back up, you know, to where we're supposed to be. And But, you know, it was pleasant to me. And most of that time, you're, you're beneath deck? Yeah. Tending to the engines? Yeah. Uh, it was a court-martial offense if you went out on deck if the weather was too bad. They didn't want you getting overboard. Whenever we were out, there was a flying bridge above, just below the bridge. We used to send a guy up to the flying bridge as a lookout. We had radar and sonar and all that stuff, but they wanted eyes in the ocean. And we looked out to see what was going on out there and if there was other ships or anything in sight. You know, we were among icebergs at times. You know, we were that far north. We'd be, you know, they were they never considered them a hazard. They weren't big enough. But you know, they'd be up there. The guys in the bridge would be able to look and see that also. Right. Yeah. Had one guy fell asleep up there. And they would send a guy up to check on him, all right? And he was sleeping. And you're not supposed to sleep on watch. And the duty officer that caught him, you know, brought him up on charges. And his claim was that he was praying and meditating. <laughs> and they let him off. They did let him <laughs> off, huh? Yeah, you know, the Coast Guard was uh, fair and lenient. And that, they knew these guys, you know, that, you know, the guy's human. He was just dozing off. The guy I reported directly to was a warrant officer. Uh, he started out as a seaman or a messman working in the kitchen, working in the galley, worked his way up, and he's a chief, which is a nice position, you know, pretty well, a lot of responsibility. When the Coast Guard said, the, the, the service had said, no discrimination, any minority can be anything he wanted, he volunteered to go back down the seaman again and go in the engine room went to the engine school, worked his way up, right up to, to be warrant officer. Nicest guy in the world. I don't, don't remember his first name, but his last name was O'Henry. Huh. Really, really super guy. Everybody loved working for him. He was a gentleman a, and a scholar, treated everybody with respect, and mostly everybody. We had one guy that was a second-class engineman came upon, came aboard in the engine room that was uh, really obnoxious, oh, really, really bad. You know, and this is a couple of days before, they went to O'Henry and they said to him, hey, we don't want this guy on patrol with it. He made a couple of phone calls up to the district office, got him transferred out. I mean, he had a lot of clout, knew a lot of people, yeah. a lot of people respected him. You know, and they didn't want this uh, bad apple, Yeah. you know, creating havoc, uh, you know, Hey, I'm a second class. I can bully people around and everything else, and that's not the way it worked. Did the Coast Guard, your time on active duty in the Coast Guard, change you or shape you in any way? Well, I think it did. I don't know that I can pin it down. I mean, I think I was basically the same person going in as when I got out. You know, I had three years working in a a butcher shop and at a grocery store and getting out and you know, it sort of geared me with a better direction than what I wanted to do. You know, and I've been always been a peddler and always talk to people everywhere I go. And, and I wanted to go into sales, and I wanted, and I I saw that. But how did that how did that idea of going into industrial sales come to you when you were in the Coast Guard? Well, I figured all those engines and all that stuff down there. There's a lot of, you know, generators, boilers, pumps. Uh, big engines and everything else, and I said, hey, this this would probably be a good field of some kind to get into, and that's the direction I took. So it was literally your proximity to these engines yeah. that made you realize, wow, there are a lot of engines and a lot of machinery in the world. Correct. And somebody's got to sell them. Right. And when I applied to Clarkson, I never went up to visit. Uh Kids now go to 10, 11, 12 colleges to visit, all right? Set up, I got the catalog. First time going through the catalog, I see a Bachelor of Science Industrial, read the description, I said, that's it. 
sent an application, was accepted. First time I saw Clarkson, well, I had a lot of trains running when I went in 1956. Took a train from Grand Central Station, New York, right up to Potsdam. I didn't know how far it was from the station or anything else. You know, Potsdam, how big a town can that town be? Got off the train, said, hey, where's Clarkson? And I wound up walking over and where do I, <laughs> where do I have? In fact, for six weeks, when I first went there, uh, they had ROTC during the war and they had an ROTC program there. They didn't have enough, a lot of guys coming back from the service. They didn't have enough dormitory space. They put us in barracks, everybody, not just vets, but even, you know, you're, you're in a regular barrack with a, with a locker on and a spring mattress and a, and a pillow. And that, that's where, we did that for six weeks before we could move in the dorm. I joined a fraternity. Uh, I had a lot of people looking for me to join their fraternity. I started with a group of guys that formed a brand new fraternity. We called ourselves initially New Phi, New Fraternity. And we organized and we had meetings and we joined together and we went over to some lady's house for lunch and dinner. And we looked at national fraternities and we applied to a couple of nationals. And we wound up joining up with a fraternity called Theta Xi, and we started a chapter in September after the first year. A lot of vets in Theta Xi, a lot of vets in the school. The best parties of any of the parties at Clarkson, and there's always parties all the time, were the vets parties because these guys are mature. Potsdam State was up there. There's a lot of girls going to Potsdam State Teachers College. And they'd hear about a vet's party coming up. The girls used to ask the guys, you know, do you know anybody needs a date? Can we go? Because they're all, you know, nobody got soused or, uh, you know, and they were all basically would look out for one another. And the ladies all knew they were safe. They weren't going to get in a hassle of any kind. When you came up in February 1956, you could have re-upped for Correct. another hitch? Correct. In fact, I could have re-upped while I was on the ship. Uh, when I told the guys I was leaving, I had a first class engine man who I worked for also, really, really wanted me to stay. And after I got out, he wound up sending me a three page letter to my house. And he said, would you reconsider coming back in again? And I wrote him back and I said, no, I've made my commitment. Uh, you know, I'm a really pleasant guy. I get along with everybody. I don't take a lot of guff from a lot of people. You know, people challenge me on something. I, I challenge back, but in a nice way. You know, I'm not hard-nosed, and they wanted me to stay in. You know, uh, I talked to everybody. I did a, really did a good job. Uh, they had a scully where, after all the meals, they had a washing machine. And the guys took their trays up and they put it in on a shelf and you put them in racks and you wash all the dishes and you take them and you put them back and everything. And I went in and went for a week and that was a, a week assignment. That's all you did for the week. You didn't have anything else to do. You just did breakfast, lunch, and supper. You know, and there are bubbles, soap bubbles all over the place. In fact, <laughs> One of the guys, one of the officers came by and said, God, look at, you know, we've never seen as many bubbles. <laughs> you know, I took it as far, it was fun. You know, I did my, it was something different. I knew it was going to end. And all it was was washing dishes and trays and silverware and everything else. Uh, we had a dance, you know, and they were trying, they, I don't know where they got the women from, but USO or someplace. And, you know, we had a dance in a hotel in St. George, Staten Island. And, you know, all the girls are on one side, all the guys are on the other side, and hey, this isn't right. I probably danced every single dance. I went up and grabbed the girl, come on. Let, you know, maybe not the same one twice. But you know, we gotta mix this up. We gotta make this worthwhile. And it was fun, you know, and, the, and a lot of the officers, you know, respected that. They knew I wasn't gonna be a problem. And I, was, I knew I was a participant, and I was an asset. 
Well, I was looking for a job during the summers when I got out of college. And I could have gone back to Christie's in a minute, but I would look, where can I make more money? You know, and I, and I enjoy, enjoyed the sea and, and the vessels and everything. And there was a Siemens Church Institute down in New York City. It's like a YMCA. Seamen from around the world stay there. Uh, I applied to the Coast Guard. I got my Coast Guard wipers ticket. Went down to Seamen's Church and talked to the guy in Seamen's Church. And I said, you know, I'd like to ship out. And he started asking me a lot of questions. And I said, to be honest with you, I'm a college student. He said, all right. You can't tell anybody if we give you a ship. You can't tell them. There's a lot of guys looking for jobs. You cannot tell them that, you know? And I said, well, I just got out of the Coast Guard. He said, all right. He said, I can put you on a ship in two days, sailing out of Bayonne, New Jersey, Tidewater Oil Company, on an oil tanker. You know, just hop your way over there and walk up and completely different than the Coast Guard. Went to the ship. Gangplank was down, nobody around. Walked up, didn't know where to go. I looked around, walked around the ship. I found the bunks. I slept in some other guy's bunk, not knowing, all right? Next morning, I got up, he said, hey, what were you doing in my bunk? <laughs> I said, ah, you needed a place to hang out and sack out. And he said, that's all right, we'll give you another assignment. And we would go from Bayonne, New Jersey, to Maracaibo, Venezuela. Uh, the ship would unload the oil in Bayonne, screws were up out of the water, put seawater in the tanks to lower it so the screw could be in the water. They're just the top of the screw used to peek out of the water. We'd go down to Maracaibo, pump all the water out, fill the tanks with oil, and go back up again. On one of those trips, we went up to, Bayonne, uh, went up to Albany, and that's only one trip during the summer. We were never in port more than 24 hours. You know, they pumped it out and pumped it in that quickly. It was just, I went to shore for a couple of hours in Maracaibo, but you know, it wasn't a very decent place. Didn't hang out very long and came back. I want to get out. what does being a veteran mean to you? What oh. does your identity as a veteran mean to you? Uh, it's, a, it's been a privilege to serve the country. You know, and, and, and do what I feel everybody should do. Uh, I'm of the opinion right now, everybody out of high school either go or to go in the service ranch or do some kind of service project before they go to college. That would mature them completely. You know, and I think the service is a good bonus for most people. I have three boys. I recommended my three boys to go in at whatever branch they wanted after getting out of high school. You pick it, and I couldn't get anyone interested in doing that. I have a daughter, and I did not recommend that for her. I think a girl in the service, you know, is really not the place to be. You know, there's a lot of squirrely guys in there that are, you know, just... And I was on some of those, with some of those guys on the ship. You know, they'd go, go aboard. But it makes you feel good, makes you patriotic, you know? And you look at the flag and you salute the flag and, you know, it brings a warm feeling to your heart and your spirit. And you say, yeah, there's something worthwhile that I accomplished. I think the bells hopefully are over. And you could say what you said at our breakfast about the Coast Guard being a unique branch of service. Ah, they are. There's no one like it. I mean, they train people to save lives. Uh, the caliber of the, I think most Coast Guardsmen are really above. I don't want to sound pompous, but they're very selective in who they take. Right now, there's only 42,000 guys in the Coast Guard. And the closest uh, recruiting station to Pittsburgh is Cleveland. If you want to go and approach the Coast Guard, Go up to Cleveland, and I've had people, I wear my Coast Guard hat a bit, and I have people stop me and talk to me about that. And we've got a son that's interested in the Coast Guard. What do we do? You know, and I make some recommendations. I got a guy, a friend of mine, whose son's graduating from California of PA, 
And he's thinking about it, and the Coast Guard says, hey, have him call me. But one of the things he ought to do, the Coast Guard used to have a station up in Swickley, close that down. They went to Carson Street, close that down. Now they're out in Heidelberg uh, in a shopping plaza, and they have two, sh two little crafts there. And I said, if you're really interested, you got to go down to the Coast Guard station, you know, make your intentions known. You never know when those people can really be of help. You know, even in business, no matter what you do, you got to network. You know, the more you network, the better contacts you have, the better off you're going to be, the better opportunities you're going to get. Well, thank you, Francis. My pleasure. I think this is in the top 10%. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay.